We're back. Welcome to the Generally Spooky Podcast. Woo! That's We're, Kieran. We are your fantastic hosts. I'm Kieran. That's Ailey over there judging me. I just said you, we were going to... Oh. You know, you could do the fun thing where I say, that's Kieran, and then you say, that's Ailey, and then, then we roll the music. Oh. You know the thing? We're going to do the thing? I mean, I was not pre-warned of the thing. The thing. But I understand the thing. Maybe just do that instead and roll the music. This is the Generally Spooky Podcast. Roll the music. Both drinking tea. Yes, we are. Because it's officially spooky season, and it's, it's cold. <laughs> spooky season is very cold. Mm-hmm. Always come on, becomes evident how far north we are when it gets to this time of year. Yeah, I feel like you notice the nights getting shorter very quickly here. Yeah. So we're, it's about half six, and like it's getting dark, and it's only going to get worse. <laughs> I saw someone on my Facebook who lives near London being like, oh, who hasn't put their heating on yet? I'm like, I would have died. Mm-hmm. It was five degrees. <laughs> <laughs> you not have your heating on but it must be warmer near London probably considerably warmer yeah I believe if that. you live in London and you're listening how warm is it with you tell us the temperature tell us we don't want to google it and Facebook is down so Facebook is down it's all going to shit I know and what's happened on Instagram what do I do with my time I'm, I'm on TikTok that's what I do with my time mm. I was just going to say peace will reign across the world <laughs> nope Everyone will breathe fresh air as they come up out of the trees like in The Hobbit. <laughs> so what do we have this week? Well, we're into October. Yep. Spooky season. Spooky season. Best here, month bitches. of the year. Absolutely. Ailey's birthday. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. Hence the reason it's the best. Yep. Also your mum's birthday. Also my mum's birthday. On Halloween, no less. Yep. And our wedding anniversary. Yep. It's a lot of good stuff in October. Mm-hmm. That's why it's the best month. So we're talking about a haunted castle this week. Ooh. It seems only appropriate. I like that. When, I'm you, when you agree, haunted I quite castle. Agree. And you know, we found out from Urquhart Castle that some castles aren't haunted. So yeah, that was a strange episode. That was. That was a really strange episode. No spooks. Well, I'm here for all the spooks. It's spooky season. We're October fourth, but you won't be listening to this for a little while. But for us, here comes the spook. <laughs> Well, today we are talking about Colleen Castle. Ooh. Now, I might slip up through this episode because Colleen Castle is spelled C U L Z E A N. I remember it from the master list now. Yes. So it's not spelled Colleen, and I'm reading my notes. So, you know, it might slip through the nets, and I just have to apologise in advance. You can be more American. We're doing Colzean Castle. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't. I cannot. F- I cannot record a podcast that way. I can't do it. We're talking about Colzean today. <laughs> That's a terrible accent. Thanks. <laughs> do you know anything about Colleen Castle? I've never heard of it. Don't never know. ever. Don't know where it is. Never ever. Even I've never heard of Colzean Castle either. No phones during the presentation, please. It's a podcast email. They can be answered after. No, yeah, I'm not going to answer. I was just reading it. No phones during the presentation, please. I'm the one giving the presentation. The presentation doesn't happen without me. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> For your information, it's someone I'm going to talk to about next week's episode. Can I please wait till after the presentation, please? <laughs> okay, fine. Fine, fine, fine. Phone's away. Phone's away. We're talking about Colleen Castle today which you know nothing about. No. And it's near Montrose in Angus. Okay. So further south in here, it's closer to Troon and Kilmarnock and Ayr. Oh, yeah, we did this before with Angus. I'm like, oh, near Aberdeen. No. But no, we did this before with something else in Angus. So that's fine. Yeah, we're, we're down near Ayr. Got you. Uh, and Colleen Castle, it's an interesting place geographically because the castle is right on... 
the west coast. Mm. On the coast. It is sitting on top of some really big cliffs. Oh, cool. With some sea caves immediately below it. Very cool. The cliffs are like 150 feet tall. And I think the estate includes like three miles of the coastline. Damn. So it's a big deal. That is a big deal. If you imagine a haunted Scottish castle, this is what's going to pop into your head. Well, sounds like some of the famous five would adventure. Kind of, yeah. And it's it has that look about it because it's a very beautiful castle. So it has that atmosphere about it just by looking at it. Mm. And, you know, this big, beautiful Scottish castle overlooking these massive cliffs on top of these caves. You know, it's very dramatic. Very cool. It actually used to be on the five pound note. Oh. The Scottish five pound note. So you've seen it without even realising you've seen it. Oh. Now that's just rung a bell. Mm hmm. Interesting. Right? I don't think I could tell you a single thing or person on any of the Scottish currency right now. Well, it's been so long since I paid for anything in cash. Well, that's true. That doesn't help. <laughs> Not no. that I examined it overly anyway, but. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I'd have a guess that Robert the Burns is on something. Robert the Burns. Robert the Burns. <laughs> You're on a Scottish history podcast and you just said Robert the Burns. <laughs> Fired. You're sacked. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll just edit myself out. We'll never work in this city again. <laughs> you know, the Robert the Burns. That was terrible. That was terrible. Well. Moving on. Mm. The Culane Estate has about 40 buildings on it. Oof. So this place is big. Mm. And in the castle itself, it has a huge armoury, which you Mm. would love. Very cool. And it has the largest collection of flintlock pistols in the UK. I can't really say a lot about what makes these special, because I don't know a lot about guns, but I looked it up, I did Mm -hmm. my due diligence, and they're called flintlock pistols because they use a piece of flint to ignite a spark to shoot the bullet. Oh. Which I never knew. Mm. It's actually a piece of flint. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Is so, that what they like, you cock it back and it pings forward and hits the flint? I mean, maybe. I wonder. I, I, re- I just said, I don't know. <laughs> this is all I know. I thought it was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. If you saw the style of pistol, you would recognise it. I, I, I recognise it. I have a picture in my head of a kind of like curved... Yes. Yes. Yeah. Curved handle. Yeah, so curved handle, kind of long. A long wooden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what that's a flintlock pistol. Well, because mm-hmm. I think I've seen maybe in Pirates of the Caribbean or something. There's a slow mo of like the it clicking back and then firing, and it goes forward and hits something that creates a spark. That's probably it. And then you like slow mo see the bullet coming out of the gun. Don't know what I saw that in, but so yeah, they have the largest collection of them in the UK. Hmm. Well, I hmm? do you know how large? Like. Don't know, don't know what the competition is. They could uh, have four. No, it's like hundreds of them, I think. Damn. It, it's a big deal. It's a lot. I saw a couple of photos and the armoury is very impressive. Is very it impressive. is It is an armoury. Well, everything's that, covered of every wall. I was just thinking, that's very much an armoury. If you just had four, I think you'd just have a cupboard. Yeah. Rather than an armoury, wouldn't you? Like a, like a display cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> we have the biggest display cabinet in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's it's a proper armory and it's a very impressive collection. What I really love about the Colleen Estate, though, is that they have these fruit trees mm-hmm. in the grounds that are nearly three hundred years old. Wow! I think it said they're peach and apricot trees or pear and I can't remember, but nearly three hundred years old. That's crazy! Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Fruit trees. I wonder if they still give fruit. I'd assume so. Yeah. Wow. Right? That's awesome. I mean, it's a very minor detail in the story I'm about to tell you, but pretty cool. I mean, it's no armory, but it's pretty cool. (laughs) It's cool to me. I prefer the fruit trees. Because I'm a boy. (laughs) (laughs) Now, from what I could see, Colleen Castle wasn't built to defend from. Mm. The castle as it is now, it hasn't seen battle or anything like that um, in its current state. It was built for the prestige and the appearance that it would give to the Kennedy family, who were the family that owned it since around the 1300s, I think. Are they part of the Kennedys? No, I don't think so. (laughs) Not the Kennedys. This is a different brand of Kennedy. Hmm. Now, I think in the 1300s, it was just, it was a building that's called a tower house, Mm -hmm. which is exactly what it sounds like. 
It's just a big house in the shape of a tower. It wasn't a fully fledged castle then. But, you know, this is another ancient place, like so many places in Scotland are. You know, there was something there since the 1300s, possibly even earlier. I read in one place that colleen has been there since about 1165. Wow. In one form or another. That's crazy. That's nearly a thousand years. Mm -hmm. That's that's a long time. Wild. Mm -hmm. It's hard to wrap your head around these things. Like anything, I think anything more than a lifetime and your brain just kind of like can't comprehend the scale of something being there for like 700 years. Well, it's like whenever you've tried to explain something to do with space travel to me. Yeah. The numbers are just too vast. I I can't understand it because I cannot comprehend it. No, it's hard. Yeah, 1165. Now, we haven't talked about him here on the podcast yet. We will, but not yet. The Kennedy family gained a lot of power and wealth after supporting Robert the Bruce during the Scottish Wars of Independence. That's why I thought... I know, I know. Yeah, that's... (laughs) (laughs) Because in my head... I knew what you meant. Is Robert the Bruce? No, that sounds silly. Oh, anyway. So they show that it pays to be on the winning side of history, because they did very well, because they supported the winning side. Good job. They won the gamble. Yeah, I guess that's what it always is, isn't it? It's a gamble. You never know. The Kennedys were so powerful that in 1457, Gilbert Kennedy was made the first Lord Kennedy. So he was given a title by the king. And he was a regent for King James III of Scotland. Oh, we've talked about him before, haven't we? We have, and we've talked about how important a position being a regent is. It's a big deal. You have a hand in how a king or queen is raised, and what kind of ruler they're going to be. Mm -hmm. So very prestigious, very powerful. I also found out that one of the Kennedys fought for Joan of Arc during the siege of Orleans. Oh. Orleans? Orleans? In France in 1428. That's crazy. Isn't it? Wow. It's one of those things that, I think because you can look at events and time in isolation, but when you see what was happening at the same time in different countries, it can be a bit confusing. Yeah. It's hard to put it all together across. Well, it's hard enough to put it all together in Scotland, isn't Mm -hmm. it? But yeah, he he fought in France with Joan of Arc. Part of the old alliance. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. In 1509, the Lord Kennedy of the time... Now, this is going to get very confusing. There's lots of Kennedys. I apologise in advance. Oh, here we go again. Uh, Lambs. Yes. Who was the other one? I can't remember. Uh, Done. Done. That was it. It just happens and I try my best to separate them and identify them in a way that will make sense to you. But I apologise, it's confusing. Long line of Ken Dodd. (laughs) (laughs) Not Ken Dodd, no. In 1509, the Lord Kennedy of that time was made the Earl of Cassillis, which began that title being handed down through the family, which also makes it difficult to tell them apart. Because you have all the different Kennedys who have the same name, and all the different, like, the first Earl, the second Earl, mm. yada yada. What's a Cassillis, do you know? I think it's just the name of the title. Mm. I can check. I wonder if it's like a, if it was an area. There's Cassillis Castle, which is near Colleen Castle. Mm. Um, I think it's just the name of the place and the name of the title. Fair I had creme de cassis in my head, but no, no, it's not the no. same thing. <laughs> Cassilis. I'll try not to use that too much. Like I said, I'll try and keep mm. them all all separated. Yeah. The first Earl, David Kennedy, was killed at the Battle of Flodden, oh. which we've talked about before. We yeah. have. It's the same ba- the same battle that King James the Fourth, Mary, Queen of Scots' dad, was killed in. Mm-hmm. So uh, the guy who was the regent. He was regent for Mary's grandfather. Yep. Just to Sign give me some context. Together. It might help, it might not. I like it. But the, yeah, the first Earl was killed at the Battle of Flodden like a lot of Scottish noblemen were, mm-hmm. and like King James IV was. The second Earl wasn't much luckier. Mm. He was murdered in England Ooh. after being sent to negotiate over some land by Margaret Tudor, who mm. was the wife of King James IV. 
Okay. The older sister of King Henry VIII. Got you. Got which you. we talked about before in our Mary Queen of Scots episode caused the Mary Queen of Scots claim on the English throne mm-hmm. and all of all of that good stuff. Was Henry VIII, was he Henry Tudor? Mm-hmm. I did not know that's because I know the Tudors. Really? Like you did, time period. Did I, I not say that? that? I apologise. Well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. They, they were the Tudors. Oh. Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. So he, he was Henry Tudor. Hmm. Just never think about it. It's like I, I was quite old when I found out that is it Windsor's the second name? Uh-huh. Yeah. Of the royal family. Yeah, yeah, they're they're the Windsors, aren't they? I was like, oh, that's why it's called Windsor Palace. I, I had no idea. Just mm-hmm. never thought about them having surnames. Anyway. There you go. I taught you something. Yay. That's always a good feeling. I think I've learned quite a lot across this. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so we talked about the second Earl murdered. The third Earl of Cassillis was one of the Scottish nobles who was invited to witness the marriage of Mary, Queen of Scots, mm. in France. But then he was poisoned when he came home, what? along with three others who had gone. Oh, no. So a very unlucky family. I know. Lots of murder. I'm impressed they kept the house in the family with all that murder going on. I know. I know. Mm. Well, like it. sometimes when that happens, it'll get passed to like a brother or... Oh, that's true. It, it kind of goes sideways instead of just straight through. Within the family. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, lots of lots of murdering. There you go. Paragraphs be like. I know. I know. One of the later earls, I couldn't find exactly which one he was. He... Mm, yeah, it's all a bit muddy. I'm getting ahead of my notes. He was called Sir Thomas Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And he managed to piss off so many people in and around Ayrshire that some of the other landowners and the lords who lived locally came together to make a plan to murder him. Oh, man. They're just all getting wrecked. <laughs> yeah. I read somewhere that he was the fourth earl, but mm-hmm. that doesn't seem to be true. Okay. He was the son of the third earl, but I don't think he was given the title. It's all a bit muddy. That is quite confusing. Uh, but his name was Thomas. That's how I'll refer mm-hmm. to him. That's all you really need to know. Uh, and he was born in 1543. So that's... 1543. Yeah, that's really, that's really all you need. In 1597, Thomas went to have dinner with one of his friends. But unknown to him, the Lairds of Ochendrain and Dunduff, two of the men who really, really hated him, mm-hmm. were waiting outside his friend's home with their servants. And they were waiting to kill Thomas as he left to go back home. They were going to ambush him. And by the sounds of things, they were all crouching in this big garden, waiting for him to step outside. And they had all all kinds of weapons with them, swords, pistols, all at the ready, Mm -hmm. waiting to kill him. So Thomas, he left the safety of his friend's house and into the murderous mob. And they fired at him, they swung at him, but somehow he managed to escape. Damn. Yeah, he ran for it basically (laughs) and apparently he came really really close to being captured by the mob but he managed to hide in a like ruined house a derelict house in the woods surrounding his friend's house jeez oh and they got so close to finding him that he could hear them searching oh my god (laughs) can you imagine that would be beyond terrifying Mm -hmm. just listening to these people who want to kill you yeah looking for you I'm imagining an almost like Monty Python esque situation where he steps out and they're all lined up on either side and they all go fire and everybody fires just as he's knelt down to tie his shoelace and they all just shoot each other across <laughs> the road. Probably not what happened. It's what happened in my head. I, I don't think that's what happened, unfortunately. Mm. Thomas managed to stay hidden as the mob moved on and away. But they felt embarrassed. Well, it was lucky that he stayed hidden, actually, because they couldn't find him. So they decided to go to Culain Castle, his mm-hmm. home, to find him there, thinking that he had escaped them, but he would go home. That's a fair assumption. Right, so they basically, I don't, they didn't break in, they barged their way into the castle and searched it from top to bottom, yeah. looking, looking for him. But they couldn't find him, because he hadn't come back yet. <laughs> so when they couldn't find him, they had to leave. <laughs> 
Wow. Lucky guy. Very. He was livid. You would be. Naturally. How dare they try to kill him just because he'd gone back on some agreements he had made and had cheated them out of hand. (laughs) How dare they? (laughs) But Thomas pursued them in court and he won. Well, that's good. Because they tried to kill him. Auchendrain had to give up his home and his land. It's very civil to take it to court. Uh, (laughs) He had to give up his home and his lands and everything, which were given to Thomas. Mm -hmm. And Dundaff was exiled to England. He had to leave the country. He wasn't allowed to come back. Now, from what I found, I know you you said that this was all very civil. Mm -hmm. Thomas took Auchendrain's property, which he was given by the court, and destroyed it all. Oh. He didn't even keep it. He just destroyed the house and the gardens and everything. Wow. What a cock. Right? It's it's a dick move, but I have to respect his commitment to getting revenge. I mean, he saw it through, mm-hmm. and they did try to kill him. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he just torched everything. Jeez, oh. Now, the only reason that Auchendrain didn't have to leave Scotland like Dunduff did is that he was made to apologise to Thomas and show repentance for everything he had done. Sorry. He had a grovel. Sorry for what? Sorry, I'm trying to kill you. <laughs> make, I'm sorry, sir. Not make eye contact. Sorry. sorry. I say it like you mean it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he had to apologise. He had to grovel. And Thomas had to be happy with his apology and accept his apology. So he had to do it properly. And on top of that, Auchendrain was forced to marry his son to Thomas's daughter. Oh. And this was try and stop more arguments and uh-huh. more feuding happening in the future because they'd be family. Mm-hmm. But in 1602, just a couple years later, Thomas was murdered. Mm. I was about to say, can you imagine that family Christmas? Like, oh, once they're family, everything will be fine. <laughs> nope. No. Oh. Nope, nope, nope. Murdered. Murked. And if that wasn't enough, he was robbed and then murdered. And he was robbed to the point where the gold buttons of his coat were stolen. Oh. So was he... I mean, I say unlucky. He was unlucky either way. But was he just unlucky? Did he just get mugged and murdered? Was it targeted? Was it planned? Well, it it was a comically frightening experience from what I've been able to find. Because he was ambushed in a forest and then murdered there. Ooh. That's why you don't walk in Central Park at night. Right. Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. You're no business there. Stay out of the woods. Uh, I think he was just travelling home. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember if it was in the night time or the daytime. I have in my head it was the night time. It's more spooky now. I'm not convinced it was. But the Auchendrains were executed for it. Oh. And they were charged with being ert and peart to the murder. Oh, ert and peart again. We talked about that last week. We did. Do you remember what I mean when I say that? Uh, Yeah, it's kind of having a hand in it. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't do the deed, but... They weren't the ones who physically murdered him, but they were responsible for the planning and the plot. Yeah, and they hired the hitman, so to speak. Kind of, yeah. They were involved in the scheme, mm-hmm. but they weren't the one who actually carried out the, the, the deed. But there's a plot twist. Mm. Auchendrain was taken to court and for this Ertz and Peart's charge, but instead of being immediately found guilty and sentenced, he pulled a Game of Thrones... And he demanded a trial by combat. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I've never considered that actually being a thing. Mm-hmm. Basically, his argument was that, you know, I would never go back on my word. Mm-hmm. That I'm an honourable person. I would never do that. I made an agreement. I committed to what I was ordered to do before. I wouldn't have done this. And if any of Thomas's family or any of his friends or allies think that I did, then they should come forward and fight me. Fight me? Mm-hmm. Damn. I hope he was taller than Tyrion was, though. I know. You have to, you have to hope that you can oppose a, like, an intimidating figure yeah. if you're demanding a trial by combat. I'll bite your kneecaps. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your weapon of choice? Ooh. Trial by combat. Uh, hmm, a blunderbuss. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'll choose a nuclear warhead. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not really sure what's, what's available at the time. Um, well, early 1600s. Mm. Um, maybe like rudimentary pistols, they're not very accurate. Oh yeah, because do you go gun, but then if you miss, 
then you have to reload the gun. But then, if it's a matter of honour, you could duel over it. That's true. That's with pistols. Or do you go for, like, a claymore? Yeah, maybe. Because if you've got a sword and they have a pistol, if they miss, then you can get them. But if they don't miss... What about a throwing axe? Mmm. Or wild dogs? Literally what I was about to say. (laughs) (laughs) But throw a wild dog at them. (laughs) A, A rabid cat. Yeah. I would do the pistol duel. And as we were turned pacing away from each other, I just like it. <laughs> <laughs> See, sucker! But you'd have to make sure you ran in a zigzag. Because they, oh, they do have pistols. Yeah. I mean, I'd be off. They'd still be walking and counting to ten. You are very fast. And I'd be I'd be 100 metres away. I mean, not quite. That'd be You're very away, quick. I'd be out there. Oh, but would you be wearing armour? That might slow you down. I would purposefully not wear armour. This mm. wouldn't be a spur of the moment. I was going to make a break for it. But then what if people believed you were going to run because you weren't wearing armour? Well, mm. you can just what if to everything mm. I decide all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, nobody came forward to fight Ockendry. Nobody was willing to die over this accusation. So he was released. Because that's the rules of the trial by combat. Damn. Isn't that wild? That is wild. Oh. Mm-hmm. That's not what I expected. No, me neither. I was so surprised. I w- had to look through quite a lot of like contemporary records and accounts from the time to get these details. It was all in like old English. It was quite difficult. I but I'm glad imagine. I did because that's a crazy story. Yeah. And from what I could see, it kind of it was a bit of a tangent to the story, so I didn't put in all of it. Pardon me. But from what I could tell, Thomas Kennedy was killed in retaliation for the death of someone else there was this battle in this ditch and someone was killed and Uh it was all about revenge all these families were just feuding with each other and they were all killing each other damn Mm -hmm. they'd all just let it be they'd all got got on a lot happier well they would have lived longer yeah that's crazy right so another murder in the House of Kennedy. Yep. Another murder for Clay Castle. He vaguely escaped and then it caught up to him two years later. Uh, I think that's what you said. You said two years later he was murdered? It was 1602 he was murdered. Oh. They attempted to murder him in 1597, so he got five years. Oh, I think he said two years. My apologies. 1602. The sixth Earl of Calissus. Okay. The sixth Earl of Cassillis was a big deal okay. again. He was the Lord Justice General of Scotland. That's a title. In the mid 1600s. He was a big deal in the legal world. I'm not going to get too bogged down on what his mm-hmm. job was because it's not hugely relevant. But he was a member of the House of Lords when Oliver Cromwell was in charge. Oof. Very in England. cool. He had a lot of power. Pardon me. So, kind of, I'm trying to paint the picture of the Kennedys as a big deal family. Yeah basically there were a lot of influential people in very influential circles at influential times yeah absolutely absolutely in the 1700s so we're jumping ahead to like 50 years the Colleen Castle that you can see today Mm -hmm. was built and created by David Kennedy who owned it at the time Mm -hmm. and Robert Adam who was the architect he was a big famous architect and they were really bold with their plans. They wanted Colleen to be the ultimate status symbol for the family. Mm. It, I said at the beginning that Colleen Castle isn't like a lot of other castles, and this is why. Mm-hmm. It wasn't built to defend the family. It was to show off their money. Bizarre. It's kind of similar when we were talking about the House of Dunn. Mm-hmm. Because it was a big Georgian mansion. And the whole point in building that was to... It's just so you have a big Georgian mansion, isn't it? Yeah, you have a big country estate and you're wealthy enough to have all of this. This is a similar thing. How? What state is it in today? Can you go and visit and stuff or is it like a ruin? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's really well preserved. They preserved a lot of antique furniture Mm -hmm. from this time, the 1700s. Oh yeah, because there's the armoury. Yeah, it's it's in good condition. Covid pending, Mm -hmm. but I think it's open again and you can go around and the gardens are really well kept. Very cool. I would quite like to go. Mm. What was I saying? 
Uh, oh, so the two men, Robert Adam and David Kennedy, mm-hmm. they worked on the castle together for about 20 years. Oh. It was a long time. They had big plans and a lot of money was put up to pay for these plans. I can imagine. But then in 1792, both men died. Ooh. Separately from each other, not related. No. But they both died before the castle was complete. And David Kennedy left about £60,000 worth of debt. Mm. Which would be about £4 million now. Oh. Cheeky bastard. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't imagine it got wiped like it does. Or it can do now when you die. No, I don't believe so. Because things had to be paid for. After this, the castle was left to David Kennedy's cousin, a man Hmm. called Captain Archibald Kennedy. But he was living in New York at the time. Oh, wow. Uh, But the reason it went to him was because he was the only one with the cash to finish the building of the (laughs) castle, which is what David really wanted. He wanted someone to have it finished. I can't imagine New York in the 1600s. 1700s. 1700s. The late 1700s. Oh, we've jumped a bit. Even still. 1792 is when they died. Okay. Can't imagine that. A very different city. Yeah. A lot shorter, I imagine. Sure. <laughs> oh, tall skyscrapers. The it building past the death is very like the cathedrals, like some of them. Yeah. You spent like a hundred, hundred years building this cathedral, transcending the generations. I saw someone saying they should do that for like space travel things. Just have this grander scale and instead of being like short term, like, oh, well, what can we do right now? I'm like, well, what can we do in a hundred years kind of thing? That makes sense. Yeah. Like they used to. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's interesting. Now, it may or may not be related to the wealth that David Kennedy had and then all of the debt. Then we'll cut it. Excuse me? <laughs> if it might not be out of mind. This is interesting. You're going to you're gonna regret suggesting that we cut this. Okay, I'm okay. kidding. During the 16 and 1700s, the sea caves below Culain Castle became very lucrative for the Kennedy family because they got involved in smuggling. Ooh, very nice. Mm-hmm. How sad would you have been if, if you had actually just cut that? Yeah, if I made you care, I'd be very sad. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. Now, I said at the beginning, Culain is on the west coast of Scotland. Mm-hmm. And it's right on the coast. And the sea caves are below it, in the cliffs. I wonder if that's why Archibald was in New York then, so they could just run the smuggling from either <laughs> side of the Atlantic. I think he was he was independently wealthy. Hmm. He had a lot of money. I can't remember what he did. He had a lot of money? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing that made Culain perfect was that it was reasonably close to the Isle of Man. Okay. Where taxes were lower. Mm. And smugglers would make more money if they landed their goods there than on like mainland UK. Mm-hmm. So they smuggled things like port, claret, rum, tea, mm. all kinds of stuff. And they made a decent profit. They made a lot of money. As you would if you were smuggling. That makes exactly. Sense. But yeah, they, they were involved in smuggling. Very interesting, interesting. Mm-hmm. I watched a thing, a documentary ages ago, about Clyde-built steamers that helped smuggle weapons into America for the Civil War. And they used to, like, you know, the steamers have, like, the big chimneys. Mm-hmm. They used to lean them down at 45 degrees so that they'd be less likely to be seen or they'd like shut off the tops and the floor used to get so hot on like the deck of the ship that you couldn't stand on it and it would warp <laughs> because there was all these engines going at full tilt and no no exhaust wow. so that they didn't make any steam so they weren't caught. <laughs> That's mad. Isn't it? They'd smuggle them from the Clyde to... I can't remember which side of the Civil War in America. Anyway, there you go. I don't know. I want to see the Union... They probably just smuggled them to whoever was paying the most. Pardon me. Well, they, I, suppose, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't comment. Yep. I'm not sure. Smuggling Scotland related. <laughs> One story from Colleen's history in particular 
really interested me and I fell down a complete rabbit hole. So I'm going to tell you that now because it also comes from the 1700s. Sounds good. Which is the time that we're we're talking about. If you go to visit Colleen, you can go and see the kitchens. Mm-hmm. And in the kitchens, there's a long list of names on one of the walls. Oh. And at the very top is the only person whose first and last name is on the list. And the name is Scipio Kennedy. Hmm. Now, I could be saying that wrong. It's S-C-I-P-I-O. But it's an unusual name. I had never heard it before. No. Well, Scipio was a slave oh. who belonged to the Kennedy family. Wow. And his story is really interesting Partly because later in his life, he was granted his freedom. Yeah. That's unreal. I didn't think you could have slaves in Scotland. Well, this is my point. I have this in my notes. I feel like the existence of slaves and slavery in Scotland and Scotland's part in the slave trade doesn't get talked about. No. And I, I have this sentence written down. I feel like a lot of Scottish people feel like it happened in other places, but we weren't involved. Uh-huh. But that's not true. Well, I knew there were slave dealers from Scotland, but I didn't think it was legal to have slaves yeah. until, in Scotland. Until the abolishment... or the, Is that a word? Abolishment? I think so. Have I made that up? Until slavery was abolished, it was completely legal to have slaves in Scotland. Well, and people go. did. Oh. Because having slaves was a mark of prestige. Uh-huh. It, it was a way of... Or particularly, we'll get into it later, but it was a way of showing how wealthy and stylish and well-off that you were uh-huh. if you had slaves. Huh. It must have just been abolished in Scotland before America. Because there was a story of some wealthy Scottish, like, Caribbean. He had a big estate out there full of slaves. And he took one of his slaves back to Scotland. And once he got to Scotland, the the boy went, well, you don't own me anymore because you can't have slaves in Scotland. I think that's the story of Joseph Knight. He went to court and he won his freedom. Yes, because you couldn't have slaves in Scotland. Mm-hmm. In well, that was in 1728. I believe. Yeah, so, so I, d- I never thought that it was just a discrepancy in the abolishment rather than... Yeah. Never had them. So there you go. It was totally legal to have slaves in Scotland. Wow. And and people did. And Brilliant. people traded in slaves. People made their fortunes. Uh, having slaves, selling slaves, working slaves. You know, it was a thing. It's yeah. It's not easy to talk about. No. But I feel that's why we should. That's yeah. why I'm excited to be able to tell Scipio's story. Now, records are shaky for the early years of his life. But it seems like he was from Guinea, which is a country on the west coast of Africa, mm-hmm. and that he was born in 1694. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, Scipio suffered in 1700 what countless Africans did at this time and after. He was captured by slave traders, and he was shipped to the Caribbean to work on the plantations there, oh. even though he was only six. Oh. And this was really common. It happened to millions of people uh-huh. and that's what happened to him he was bound for the caribbean Jesus. so it's interesting you saying about yeah um, the scottish landowners in the caribbean it was very lucrative there was a lot of money to be uh-huh. made what's really quite tragic and telling even this early in the story is that i have no idea what his birth name was uh-huh. it wasn't written down anywhere we only have the name Scipio, which was given to him by his future owner. Yeah. Oh. Horrible. Like, yeah, we don't even know his name. Just horrible. Mm. Yeah. I wanted to make that point, because yeah. it's, it's horrible. And I don't think I need to explain in huge, huge detail how traumatic this all must have been for Scipio. Um, and it was only made worse by how dangerous the ship journey was oh, yeah. for the people who were stolen. Many of them didn't survive the crossing. Uh So if you think of the route from Guinea on the west coast of Africa to the Caribbean, this route is called the Middle Passage. I I didn't know that before. But about two million people were forced to take it on these slave ships. Oh, so many. Well, about 15% of them died. They didn't make it. And the trip could take anywhere from one to six months. Oh. Because it depended on the weather. Yeah. You know, remember, this is the late 
1600s, early 1700s. And slaves on board weren't cared for. Jeez, they were oh. barely treated as human. No. The, the conditions were appalling. And, you know, quite often they were just thrown overboard. But somehow Scipio survived, even though he was so young. Oh. I saw speculation about maybe he was taken with his family, so he had someone caring for him. Or was taken under the wing by someone on the ship uh-huh. who made sure that he was cared for as best as they could manage. Yeah. But I don't really want to say he was lucky because I he's not. It's no. an awful thing to go through. Uh-huh. He he just survived. Yeah. Basically. Now the treatment of slaves in the Caribbean was brutal. Mm-hmm. It was bad everywhere. I'm not saying it wasn't, but the Caribbean had a really bad reputation for how slaves were treated. Because the people who owned slaves, white people, the landowners, uh-huh. they were vastly outnumbered by black people and the slaves that they owned. Mm-hmm. So they felt constantly threatened by rebellion and uprising and all mm-hmm. that good stuff. So they used violence to make sure slaves were too afraid to step out of line. Oh, jeez. Oh. Yeah. So that's, that's where he's headed. Mm-hmm. That's going to be his life. He's only a child. And it's at this point that a man called Captain Andrew Douglas found Scipio in the West Indies and he bought him. Oh. And he was actually the one who gave him the name Scipio, which I really hope I'm saying right. I should probably have checked. Now, I didn't know this, and it seems cruel and dehumanising because I feel like this is now something that isn't out of place for pet owners to do. Uh-huh. And Douglas named his new slave Scipio after an infamous, powerful Roman general who was called Scipio Africanus. Oh. He was deemed one of the greatest military strategists of all time. Oh. And it was a trend among slave owners, you know, super chill, to name slaves after really powerful people as a kind of joke to the fact that they had no power. Oh, God. So this was really common. Yeah. And there's actually, I got momentarily mixed up when I was doing this research because there's a grave of a slave in Bristol. Uh huh. And the slave is called Scipio Africanus. He has the same name, but it's not the same person. But after the Black Lives Matter protests in Bristol, where they took down the statue, Mm -hmm. his slave was, his his grave was vandalised by people who didn't like that the statue had been taken down. Oh, oh, oh no. Yeah. I think about the guy whose statue, his no, grave. No, no, the slave's grave oh. was vandalised. It was like pushed over and broken and people like, wrote on it with chalk, chalk, all these threats about what they were going to do if the statue wasn't restored. That's the thing that happened. That is fucked. And that was last year, this year. God. Luckily, money was raised. People were so oh. upset by this. Money was raised to restore it and it's been put back together and it's it's perfectly fine now. But that's the thing that happened. And that's a slave who had the same name as Scipio. Jeez, oh. Mm-hmm. So that's not technically related to our story, but... It's just a thing. Mm-hmm. Oh. But, you know, that way of naming someone, it's the way you might name a pet. Oh, yeah. Because it's... Well, our dog's Odin. Well, you know, it's like giving a, a pet a really, like, intellectual-sounding name uh-huh. because, you know, they can't think. Yeah. God. So you think of that happening to a person, and then yeah. that's the name he had for his entire life. I wanted to get spooked, not bummed out. Well, we need to talk <laughs> about it. Yeah. It's important. It's a whole part of Scottish history that mm-hmm. nobody really talks or knows about. I will not be judged for <laughs> including this in the episode. I won't. It's relevant. Yep. So his name's... Scipio. In the, uh, his name's in the kitchen. Yes. And it seems likely that Captain Douglas bought Scipio to be a servant, a mm-hmm. page boy, for his daughter Jean. Because this, like I said, this was the fashion at the time. Mm-hmm. All the best families and all the wealthiest families had black page boys. It was, it showed how wealthy you were. There's loads of portraits of fancy men and women with black page boys yeah. in the portraits looking up at them adoringly like well, I've seen them like dogs well, like some of them oh. it's it's it was a thing and they were treated kind of like pets like they would be dressed up really nice 
really nicely and they'd be paraded around for company and all that stuff. So Scipio belonged to Jean Douglas and Jean married into the Kennedy family. Which is how Scipio ended up at Colleen Castle. Oh, okay, yeah. He went with her to her new marital home. And from the evidence that's been found about his life, it seems like Scipio was well liked by the Kennedy family. It appears that they were really fond of him. And he was Jean's slave until 1725, mm-hmm. which is when John, her husband, and Jean granted Scipio his freedom. Mm. In 1725, this was a pretty unheard of thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, I have it in my notes. It was 1778 that Joseph Knight brought his freedom case to court, and that was in Perthshire. Interesting. And he won his freedom back from his master, who was a man called John Wedderburn. Uh But that was 78, not 28, like I said. Now, Scipio signed his own manumission, which is a document that grants him freedom from the Kennedy family. So he signed it himself, which, again, was unheard of because it meant he knew how to write. Yeah. Now, it, the signature, I've seen it, I've seen the document, is very shaky and very uncertain. So historians who have examined it think that his name is the only thing he knew how to write. Yeah. And it's it's called being sign literate. That you aren't actually literate, but being able to sign your name was how people used to define being literate. That makes sense. Yeah. So he did, he signed it himself. And according to the do- the document, Scipio was given his freedom on the basis that he was a committed Christian man. Huh. So he had converted to Christianity. And he even took on the Kennedy surname. Huh. So he w- on the document, he signed Scipio Kennedy. And he was trained and taught the textile manufacturing business. So he had a trade. But Very when we- good. Yeah, amazing. But when we talk about Scipio being free, we have to be realistic about what that means yeah which we'll get into the the document the manumission says that scipio is allowed to leave the kennedy family and work wherever he wants he's entitled to pay but realistically where was he going to go yeah he had no savings he had no one except the kennedys because you know he's been a slave Uh uh-huh and the kennedys were this big and powerful and influential family so you know, he's not really got anywhere to go. And no. slavery was still legal. So it would have been very difficult for him to leave Killeen and start a completely new life. Yeah. So in the manumission, it shows that Scipio stayed with the Kennedys and he committed to working for them for the next 19 years. Oh. But he would be reasonably paid for his work. He didn't get a huge salary, but no. he didn't get the minimum that a servant could expect. He was somewhere no, in the middle. That's, that's pretty But what's interesting is that in the manumission, it also says that Scipio will start getting a share in something that's referred to as the drink money. (laughs) And remember I mentioned earlier that they're smuggling. Oh, yeah. So it seems like he was in on it. (laughs) And he would be getting a portion of the profit from this smuggling endeavour. So Scipio was technically free. Mm -hmm. Technically. He was earning money now. But in 1728... Scipio was found guilty of a crime. Oh. Just three years after being freed. Oh, no. Do you want to guess what the crime was? Thieving. Nope. Uh, murdering. Nope. Raping. Nope. Uh, I don't know. It was scandalous. He was charged with fornication. <gasps> Gasp. Now, before you get too, too wound up, fornication then basically just meant that two people had had sex without being married. (laughs) Which was a big deal at the time. Less so now, but (laughs) that's what he was charged with. He'd been discovered with a woman named Margaret Gray, who lived locally. Uh And and they were married a few months after Scipio was charged. And this was also several months after their first daughter was born. (laughs) So, baby out of wedlock, shock horror. But this was a perk of Scipio's newfound freedom. He was allowed to get married. But his marriage was an important step on another level. Because remember I said in his freedom document, the Uh manumission, he had converted to Christianity. Uh Well, if you refused to get married after being charged with fornication, you ran the risk of being excommunicated from the church. Oh, no. Now, if Scipio isn't a good Christian man anymore and gets excommunicated... His freedom's at risk. Yeah. So it was it was very important that they do this. That makes sense. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In total, Scipio and Margaret had eight children together. Oof. Not that uncommon for the time, but mm-hmm. it still baffles me. Eight children. I know. It's a lot of children. And a map of Killeen Castle and the grounds from 1755 was discovered fairly recently. Uh-huh. And there was something really interesting on there. There's a small square in the grounds representing a house. And this house is labelled Scipio. Oh. So it looks like the Kennedys built a house for him and his family to live wow. in. And, and work. Uh-huh. Now, other people who were around with Scipio, suggested that a lot of the smuggling rendezvous happened in his house. (laughs) So it may have served a dual purpose. Mm -hmm. He lived very close to the castle, but, you know, the meetings would happen there instead of in the Kennedy's house. Yep. Well, yeah, just already, if all goes down, it's like, oh, this was his fault. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with us. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, he he had a house, he had a family. Well, I mean, that's that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's nice. In the scheme of things, that's pretty good. Later, in 1767, Jean died. Uh So Scipio's old mistress was dead. Uh And her will, her last will and testament, could act as a piece of evidence that she genuinely cared for Scipio. Uh I'm hesitant to say whether or not this was definitely true or that Scipio reciprocated because they had bought and owned him. So, you know, he doesn't owe them anything. No. But Jean left Scipio some money in her will. Oh. And she left him an amount that was comparable to the amount that she left her own children. Oh, wow. Believe it or not, he was left £10, which was a lot more then. That's pretty good. And her children were left £40 to split three ways. Oh. So, you know, it's comparable. Yeah. It's less, but it's comparable. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was a lot of money in those days. And it makes sure he gets some. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you can see why this might suggest that she cared for him and wanted to help him. Just to give him a bit of a boost. Yeah. How nice. Yeah. Scipio lived until he was 80. Wow. He died in 1774, and he was buried in Kirkoswald. Kirkoswald? Mm. It's a small village near Killeen Castle. He was buried there by his son. And you can still see his headstone. His headstone's still there. Now, his house in the castle grounds was demolished at some point. So when the estate map that I mentioned earlier was discovered, archaeologists were really curious about where the house had actually been. Yeah. And in 2007, after digging on the estate, they found it. Or where they thought. They found bits of pottery and glass fragments and things that you would use in the textile business, Mm. which is what he was trained in. So it seems like they found where his house was. Very cool. Now, I just thought that was such an interesting piece of Killeen's history. Yeah. And it's, def- it's not a typical story you'd hear about Scotch Castle. So I hope you don't mind that I told it. I like it. I thought it was very interesting. So who were the other names, do you know? I don't... It was... The list was names of servants who had worked in the castle. Oh. And nobody else had their full name on there. Yeah. Except him. He had Scipio Kennedy right at the top. Huh. So yeah, that's that's Scipio's story. Very cool. Very different. Yeah. The castle itself, Colleen, wasn't finished until about 1800. Oh yeah, because it was... Yeah. So it took it like another 100 years for everything to be completely done after Robert Adam and David Kennedy died. Well, thank goodness it's still there. I know. Because <laughs> it was in about 1800 that the West Wing was finished. Mm-hmm. So that was when everything was finally done. And the Kennedys gave the castle to the National Trust for Scotland Mm. in 1945. Very cool. But one of their conditions for donating it to the National Trust was that the top floor be preserved and given to General Eisenhower from the USA as a thank you for his service during World War II. (laughs) That's, That's random. And he made use of it. He visited several times, even when he became president. Wow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I thought it was so random. That is really random. Yeah, just to to thank him for what he had done. I wonder if they, like, knew him. I don't think so, but he was a very well-known figure among the Allied forces in Uh World War II. He he led a lot of the coordinated efforts of, like, the Allied countries, not just America. So he did a lot. Yeah. But I did also read that... 
part of the thinking of donating the castle to the trust uh-huh. meant that no one had to pay any inheritance tax. Oh, well, see, I was like, there's got to be a write-off. That's got to be a tax write-off. <laughs> which, which I'm just going to leave for your consideration. Yeah. You can make of that what you will. Maybe that'll appear in those documents the Guardian leaked. Oh, yeah, they, they just got released over. last night. Yeah. The Pandora Papers. Yeah. Maybe that'll be in there. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. In 1972, parts of the film The Wicker Man were filmed at Killeen. Oh. Have you seen it? Do you know of The Wicker Man? I've not seen it, but I know it, and I know the story. Super creepy. Because I think it's a Black Sabbath song, or album or something. It's called The Wicker Man. And then I looked into it, and I was just like, oh, mm-hmm. no. Christopher <laughs> Lee is in it. Christopher Lee... Sarah. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. Sarah Man. Sarah Man. Very cool. And Dracula. And Dracula. And other things that aren't Lord of the Rings. Yeah, but. he's in it. And he believed in the film so much, he starred in it for free. Wow. Because he just wanted the film made. Like, they didn't have a lot of money, so he just uh. did it. Because <laughs> he cared about the film. I wonder why. And that, I just said why. Well, I mean, but like, why Why the Wicker Man? The just the, the story and the, yeah. the concept for the movie. He just loved it. Very cool. He wanted it made, so... <laughs> Yeah, he he didn't get paid for it. Weird. And he said in another interview that that was the film he was the most proud of. Oh, wow. Across his career. Yeah. It was The Wicker Man. Huh. I like that. I mean, we should do some kind of live stream or something where we watch it together. Ooh, spooky. It's the perfect time. And it's spooky it's, season. It's a really creepy movie. <laughs> the castle reopened in 2011. It had oh. been shut for a long time. And it was reopened because the National Trust was given a huge donation from a millionaire called William Lindsay who was from America and he was super interested in the life and the history of Eisenhower so he donated to Colleen Castle to maintain it because Eisenhower had stayed there huh. even though he had never been in Scotland before that's so strange he, he left it in his will I think I was wondering like because who has it do the Eisenhowers still have it the top floor I wonder or did when he passed away, did he then leave it that top floor to the National Trust? I don't know. I don't know what the what the deal is there. I'm sure. But William Lindsay, because he left that in his will, he was responsible for Colleen being brought back and wow. is the reason you can now visit it. Huh. And he never set foot in the place. That's so weird. Yeah. So now, to answer your very earlier question, you can go and visit Colleen yeah. Castle <laughs> and you can wander around it and all kinds of things. Thanks to Mr. Lindsay. Mm-hmm. That's just so random. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's it's a good use of a fortune. It's very nice. It's very nice. I always feel that when people leave it to like dog homes or like cat rescue. Yeah. But yeah. Good use of your money. Yep. Can't argue with that. <laughs> but now we're at the really good bit of the episode. Oh, I'll be so heartbroken if you say the end and it just finishes. What? what, what? <laughs> we are at the spooky part. Yeah. And there are lots of spooky stories and legends that come from Colleen. I've been really looking forward to talk to you about Ooh. them. I wonder if anyone's going to just like skip to the spooky part of the podcast. Like in My Favourite Murder, oh, yeah. where someone says, like, oh, yeah, this is where the, like, the, the murder starts. starts. The murder starts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. If you if you skip to the spook, you should let us know. Spook at 59 minutes pre-editing. <laughs> I mean, there's not much I can do, because I love getting into the history, so I'm not, I'm not going to stop doing it, because I think it gives a lot of context to the spook. I like it. Well, obviously, otherwise I'd ask you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you'd ask me to give you a shout from the other room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've gone to the spooky bit. Was, oh, get me in. <laughs> <laughs> well... Cast your mind back to the beginning of the episode. I was wondering if Thomas was going to be a ghost. Not that I know of. I was just, that was... At the beginning, I mentioned that Colleen is in a really interesting spot. It's right on the coast, yep. above all these tall cliffs and these sea caves. It seems like the caves are haunted. Mm. Now that is the stuff of actual nightmares. A yeah. haunted cave. You get a lot of really weird noises in caves, especially caves by the sea. Mm-hmm. Just, it, it would unnerve me so yeah. much. Of it. I don't really like the sea, so just caves being under. No, 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 no. Nope. In 1630, to so we're all the way back. 
all the way back. Sir William Brereton. Brereton. I know, Brereton. Brereton. He was visiting Culloden as part of this epic tour around the whole country that he was doing. He was going around all of Britain. Akin to Robbie, Robbie the Burns. <laughs> Robbie the Burns. <laughs> He was taken down to the caves uh-huh. to be shown around because he was he was staying locally. And he was led in by a few servants. And one of the servants was carrying a candle to light their way. Mm-hmm. And he was speaking to locals about it and locals had been saying for a long time that the caves were haunted. And this is back in 1630, people were saying this. Now, he was listening to all of their stories and he was immediately on his guard because... He believed that they were kind of having him on. Yeah. Because he was visiting and he thought they were like playing it up to try and scare him and they were trying to wind him up on purpose. They probably were a bit, to be fair. Well, as they walked through the cave, he saw that there were lots and lots of sets of footprints in the sand. Mm. Adults, children, animals, all kinds of footprints. And... He had been listening to the stories that there were ghosts in the caves, and uh-huh. he guessed that his tour guide had set up the footprints ahead of time to scare him, because it was only a couple of them that were going through there. No one had been in ahead of them, uh-huh. so there was no reason for these footprints to be in the sand. So William asked his guides about the footprints, hoping to catch them in their lie, but as they all looked down at them, everyone got increasingly uncomfortable. And that was when the guides confessed that they had no idea where the footprints had come from Mm -hmm. and that they've been trying to figure it out for a long time. They regularly come into the cave and see the footprints that shouldn't be there and they cover them all up. They get rid of them. But they stay at the cave as night falls, watching, waiting to see where these footprints come from. Uh. And they see no one. But when morning comes, the cave is full of footprints again. That's pretty creepy. And this was in 1630, so people have been talking about ghosts in that cave for a long <laughs> time. Well, because I was going to say, well, it's obviously just someone else. So no one's been in here. Like, well, obviously someone's been in here. <laughs> nope. Spooky. Now, the stories were so rife that years later, a local piper decided he was going to take action and debunk the stories for himself. Now, everyone was so convinced the caves were haunted, and he basically said enough was enough. Mm -hmm. Um, He wanted to debunk it. I will say, I've only just made a connection in my detective brain. (laughs) Those stories were 1630, Mm -hmm. and they were smuggling from the caves in the 16 and 1700s. Oh, yeah. So maybe they were seeing footprints, and they were hearing noises, but it's not a ghost. Smugglers. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. Because that's pretty common. Yeah. I've only just... I've only just made that connection. That would make a lot of sense. In my brain. But that doesn't explain this part of the story. Mm -hmm. He, the local... The local piper, he was going to debunk it. He was fed up people getting scared and talking about it. He wanted to deal with it. And he had a pretty good plan because, you know, these caves are all part of a network. Uh And you can get into these caves from a hill sort of further back I think it's called Piper's Bray um, you can get into the caves from down there and then make your way to the, the exit are they named after this guy? Ooh, maybe <laughs> so he decided he was going to go into the caves at the entrance near Killeen Castle and then he was going to emerge from a different exit and he was going to pipe the whole way so people would be able to hear him in the caves uh-huh. know that he's made his way through realise that, you know, it's just a cave and then it would be dealt with, it would be over. So a crowd gathered to watch the piper go into the caves as he started to play. Uh And he disappeared into the dark with his dog. His dog went with him. Now as time passed, the crowd could hear the pipes playing as he was making his way through the caves. It'd be so loud, pipes in a cave. (laughs) Exactly, but that was the point. Yeah. And they could hear the dog. He could even be heard at Killeen Castle itself. They could hear him. But then the music started to fade until they couldn't hear anything anymore. Now, naturally, the crowd assumed that he had made his way out of the cave to the exit that he had planned, and they just couldn't hear him anymore. So they went to check and to talk to him. But the piper was nowhere to be found. And a search party went into the caves to find him, 
and he was never seen again. Oh. Or his dog. Oh. That's pretty creepy. Mm-hmm. Spooky. So now a lot of people claim that they hear piping from the caves. Oh, yeah. But, you know, nobody's ever there. And there's a, a legend that whenever there's a, f- a wedding in the Kennedy family, they hear piping the night before. Oh, the ghost piper. Mm-hmm. And if you're not aware, piping at a wedding is traditional. As a tradition. Mm-hmm. And some people have even seen a man standing on what is now called Piper's Bray near the castle, completely alone. He Ooh. just stands there. The lone Piper. Mm-hmm. The ghostly Piper. We ought to pay the Piper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think pay was the issue. I think ghosts were the issue. <laughs> Maybe bad lighting was the issue. What do you think? I uh, think spooky. Another story focuses on the fourth Earl of Cassillis, a man called Gilbert Kennedy. Oh, I thought Thomas was the fourth. Well, remember I said he was the son of the third. This is why I had to go back and check, because some places said he was the fourth. Uh But according to this, Gilbert Kennedy is the fourth. Gotcha. This is why it gets confusing. So from what I can see, this is the fourth Earl, Gilbert Kennedy. Yeah. And I've checked it in a few different places. He might have he might have become the fourth when Thomas died. Maybe. But fourth Earl. Now he was ideally suited to being an Earl because he was hungry for more land and more power. <laughs> he wanted as much as he could get, and he wasn't above cheating or causing harm to get what he wanted. That that does fit the bill. Yes. So ideally suited, the job is his. A local landowner called Alan Stewart, uh, I don't think he's related to the Stewarts of Appen from last week. Oh, yeah. Um, he was the commendator of Cross Ragel Abbey, which is close to Killeen Castle. So it's he's living in a very different place to the Stewarts of Appen, which is why I think they're not related. Yeah. There's a lot of Stewarts of it. There are, aren't there? Too many. Too many. Too many. But the problem with the Abbey being so close to Killeen is that when Alan Stewart was going about his daily business, it was very easy for him to be waylaid. Now, Stewart had considerable power, considerable power in his role, uh-huh. but Gilbert wanted his land. Mm. So there's a big old target on Stewart's back. Yeah. And he ended up being taken captive Oh, no. As he was passing through and close by Killeen Castle. And he was led down to the dungeons of the castle. Which do exist. They are real. Is it a castle if it doesn't have a dungeon? Right, I feel like that should be a prerequisite. Yeah. You should have to tick the box. Is it just a big house otherwise? To get your castle certificate. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he was led down to a cell in particular that's called the Black Vault. And he was tied up which he may have expected. But he can't have been expecting to be tied to a pole. Oh. What's the purpose of that? Why would anyone want to do that? Stuart was tipped over with both ends of the pole propped up, leaving him dangling. And then a fire was lit underneath him. So he's like on a... On a spit. Yes. Gilbert Kennedy had Alan Stewart roasted on a spit. Oh, what a maniac. Mm -hmm. And he was tortured like this until he was on the verge of death. And he was only saved because he agreed to sign over all his land to Gilbert. Fuck. Oh. What what's a, what's a common data of an abbey do? I tried to work it out and I got a lot of confusing information i think he was just an important figure he had authority where the abbey was concerned but i don't want to say anything with conviction because i really don't know because yeah, i was thinking like should he have roast alive someone of the church and well no i don't think he was a clergyman yeah but i, I couldn't tell you with 100 percent. it might just be that he owned the land the abbey was on Plus, i can't he, com- he accommodated the Abbey. What well, was commendator? His, but just, because well, the word sounds similar, isn't the same, but... I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't want to say anything 
because I, I would just be making it up. Yeah, but basically, most, oh my he had the authority to sign, to sign over this land oh. to Gilbert. Yeah, that's some, some saw shit right there. Yeah, now. being roasted on a spit. Oh. Now, Stuart was taken off the spit because he had given away all of his land. <laughs> but he was held at Culloden while the, pa- the paperwork was finalised. But when he refused to complete it all, he was put on the spit again. Oh, no. So we had to endure this twice. Oh, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Well, I wonder if he's hoping, like, oh, he's bluffing. He won't actually... I suppose if he did kill him, he wouldn't get the land, would he? It would be in his will. Oh. Which is why he nearly killed him. Yeah. Eventually, the Privy Council in Edinburgh heard about what Gilbert had done. So remember... Back to the Privy. When we were talking about the witchcraft trials. Yes. That it all went through the Privy Council. Yep. They heard about what Gilbert had done, and they were horrified. So they forced Gilbert to pay Stuart £2,000 for what he had put him through. Which, remember, is... It's, it's a lot, but... Mm-hmm. As well as paying him a pension monthly for the rest of his life. Oh, well, it's something at least... But, for some strange reason, Gilbert was allowed to keep Alan Stewart's land. Oh. Oh. Horrendous. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So now, at the castle, people have heard and claim to hear really vicious, awful screaming coming from the dungeons below. And the sensation of feeling or hearing a crackling fire even though there's definitely not one down there Can you imagine the smell mm-hmm. it's like Stuart's torture seeped into the stone yeah. and never left can you go down to the dungeons I wonder I don't know if that's part of the tour I would assume that you can yeah. because it's all been kept well but this is people hearing screams from below without necessarily being there so yeah. they're just hearing it from below them these really agonizing painful screams God. Mm-hmm. that's horrendous i can think a few things worse than hearing that no i just i can't i can't even imagine can you imagine at the time, just being like a servant in the castle, uh-huh. and there you are, just like doing the laundry, and you're hearing this happening, and you just have to be like, "Yeah, this is fine. Just see no evil, hear no evil." Well, you don't I'm, get I'm an minding op- my own business. You don't get an opinion. No, you are less than. You are below than, and you would not be thanked for giving one. God, right? Horrendous. Now, the castle itself. So that's underground and below. Yep. And the piper has been seen and heard in the caves. Awaiting payment, yep. <laughs> the castle itself has lots of phantoms mm. in different places. A little girl has been seen running up and down the halls near the kitchen, out of like the corner of people's eye. They see her, they hear her, but no one really knows who she might be. Uh-huh. But... <laughs> This might be a bit of a a turn for us, but the group from Most Haunted (laughs) investigated Killeen Castle in 2002 for their first season, so it's it's early. Mm. Now, we did discuss this earlier. We did. I am open to us sitting and watching the episode so that you can talk about this in real time for the podcast, or we we don't have to. Obviously, we won't put you through the whole 20 minutes if you're listening to this, because copyright is a thing. But <laughs> Kieran and I have discussed watching the episode together. Because I've seen it. No, I think it'd be too cringe. I don't think I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, basically, I hated it. Yeah. You just, it was awful. You said you were watching it and you were you were laughing. I was, was laughing. I couldn't help it. I was, like, cackling laughing. I'm not a Most Haunted fan. I used to be when I was a lot younger. I'm not now, but in the episode, no. they chat a lot about orbs and lights. Oh yeah, and they show like it, it's dust. It's just it, it's dust. And Derek Akora, their psychic, has a lot to answer for. He reels off like, all these ghosts that he's encountering in the building, but it's information that's widely available about the history of the castle and who lived there. <laughs> so 
he's obviously researched it ahead he's of done time. done his yes, research. Because he, like, says, oh, I'm, I'm picking up on a piper. That's really strange, a piper. There's a piper. But it's, oh, well, what's his name? Oh, well, he's just, he's just the piper. And he says, but he has, he has red hair, you know, like all Scottish people do. I know, like all stereotypical Scottish people do. And then there's a moment where he, like, really abruptly, he takes off his ring and, like, puts it down on the table. He's like, why did you make me do that? Why did you... Oh, is it a wedding band? Are you are you trying to make me think of weddings? Because there's a legend about the piper playing at weddings. God, it's just like really bad cold reading. Oh, isn't it? it just I had to laugh. Oh. and that's not me trying to say all psychics are terrible. That's oh. not. This is based on this one episode that I watched. It was awful, oh, no. <laughs> and it just made me laugh. It was really cringe. Too cringe. Mm-hmm. Oh no, 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 no. So no, they no. went and I say this. Very sarcastically, they investigated all the castle ghosts. They went and got spooked. They did. There was so much gasping. So much gasping. <laughs> oh my god, oh my god. It just They lost their shit because a burglar alarm sensor went off. Like the light. <laughs> it was just the light flashing and they lost their mind. Oh my god, what is that? That's it's just a light. Yeah. Oh, no. So I found other sources for these ghosts and ghost stories. More useful. You'll be pleased to hear. Uh, 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 reliable sources. Yeah. Yeah. A paranormal investigation group from Cumbernauld oh. investigated Colleen in 2005. And I haven't heard the recordings, but they captured several in what's called the Earl's bedroom. Uh-huh. So it's like the master bedroom. The master bedroom. And the recordings sound apparently, like, screaming and hissing. Ugh. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That's got some nasty connotations mm-hmm. to it. Hissing. Don't like that. No. A man called Bill Rogers, who worked as a guide at Colleen, retold some of his experiences for the National Trust website. Oh, yeah. So I thought I'd tell you those uh-huh. just now, because, you know, he's telling his own stories. So this is the first one. A young family stepped into the room that I was monitoring. The mother cautiously asked if the previous room, the blue drawing room, was haunted. I asked why. And she said, you'd better speak to my husband. (laughs) He looked quite shaken and told me he'd been helping their two children look for Lego figures hidden in the castle. Like a scavenger hunt, I think. Or just stealing. (laughs) No. (laughs) When he noticed movement out of the corner of his eye. He saw a writing desk with two inkwells and observed one of the lids slowly closing as the other one was slowly rising, with no one apart from his family in the room. He resolutely refused to return to the room to show me what had happened. That's pretty weird. Mm -hmm. I like that that's so minor. Well, I like that one because it sounds like how you would react. So I'm inclined to believe it. Yeah. There's something about it. It tends to be, like, men in these stories. If a man sees something weird, it's just like, what the fuck nope, was nope, that? Nope, nope, yeah. nope, <laughs> nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Packed up his nopes and got the fuck out of there. Yeah. The second story is this. On another occasion, at the end of a general tour that I led, a young lady in her mid-twenties reported that someone had gently pushed her forward. I asked for a description and where it happened. She then gave a statement to the head guide and another witness that when she turned around, there was no one else in the room, the state bedroom. This is widely known as the most haunted room at Colleen, where the ghost of the ninth Earl himself, Thomas Kennedy, makes himself known. But then he says, the room also featured in the paranormal reality television series Most Haunted. (laughs) It's spooky. That is pretty spooky. From someone who works there all the time. Yeah, I like that much more reliable I think and I quite like that it's it's just things you can't explain it reminds me of how I felt when we did our City of the Dead tour yeah I was thinking that and the stories our guy told us then Mm -hmm. they're much more because like with the ink pot lids it's not they were thrown across the room and they smashed and then words appeared in the ink that said like die or that's exactly what I'm thinking it's It's not just like like, obviously that didn't happen it's fairly minor yeah really just like feeling like someone's pushing you. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. The castle also boasts what could be a haunted portrait. 
at all. Isn't that the most amazing thing for a haunted house to have? That is. A haunted painting. <laughs> but this story really excited me, and it's not for a spooky reason. So just wait. Apparently, people have seen really strange mists oh. and apparitions around the portrait. So the portrait is on the really grand staircase that is in the middle of the castle. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. And the portrait is in one of the landings. So people see a mist form at the painting and then move down the stairs as if someone's walking there. Mm-hmm. And people are uneasy with the portrait itself. Like her eyes follow you around. And some people even claim to have seen her feet move as they walk by the painting. That's weird. But the subject of this painting is Margaret Erskine of the House of Dunn. <sighs> Are you surprised? Very surprised. Because I was. What? That's, that, that's spooky. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Mm-hmm. If you haven't listened, episode three is about the House of Dunn yeah. and all the Erskines who live there. Many Erskines. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's really weird. I wouldn't be offended if you don't get as excited as I am over this fact. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't believe there was a connection yeah. between the two. So Margaret Erskine married the 12th Earl of Cassillis, oh. Archibald Kennedy, and it's her portrait that's supposedly haunted. Weird. So to try and put this into context for you, six generations before Margaret Erskine uh-huh. were the brothers who were poisoned by their family. Ugh. So there you go. Yeah. Isn't that wild? That is wild. That's... Pardon me. I like that. The generally spooky cinematic universe Mm -hmm. expands. Another connection. Yeah. The Erskines married into the Kennedy family. It does make sense, because I imagine a lot of the big families did that probably multiple times. Yeah, it makes total... That's why I'm not... I don't think anyone else will get as excited as I do. It's just, I get so into the research. It's always really interesting to me when I find a connection. Mm -hmm. I think the spookiest painting is the one Phoebe has that has the mannequin coming out of it and friends. (laughs) Gladys! Yeah. Gladys is the spookiest painting. (laughs) Gwyneth. I was a bit Wario then. I have one last Colleen legend for you. The last little bit of spook. Yes, and I saved it for the end on purpose. Ooh. It includes the Covenanters. Oh. Remember them? I do remember them. The people who refused to accept that their king was above God. Yep. The ones who were relentlessly persecuted and hunted down. For their very reasonable beliefs. Yes, them. <laughs> <laughs> In 1685, the man of Killeen Castle was Sir Archibald Kennedy. Mm-hmm. So not the one that we just talked about, I don't no, think. It's quite a few Archibald. Yeah, this is why it's difficult. Yeah. It's all the same name. But he had the, the lovely nickname Archibald the Wicked. Mm. He hated the Covenanters. He was a committed and zealous Catholic. And he actively hunted Covenanters down. Well, how can you have a relative who roasted a man over an open fire and he's not the wicked you are? Yeah. Horrendous. Madness. Madness. Now, it was common at this time for ministers and covenanters to gather in outdoor spaces yep. to worship privately and safely because they they didn't want to convert. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, a group of them had gathered near Killeen Castle and Archibald enjoyed hunting for these gatherings. He would seek them out with his men and he came upon this group and he ordered the men who were with him to attack them. A man called Gilbert McAdam was one of the worshippers and he was there with his elderly mother and he himself had to walk with a stick, so not very mobile. And when he saw Archibald and his men approaching... There was very little that he could do, but he really tried to protect his mother to the point where he was using his walking stick against their muskets. Oh, man. And one of the men tried to strike Gilbert's mother in the head with the butt of his gun, (sighs) but Gilbert managed to save her. He managed to hit the gun away, and they tried to run. But like I said, they weren't very mobile. They weren't very fast. And they were spotted by one of the horsemen 
who turned out to be Sir Archibald himself. Oh. And oh, he no. chased them into the trees. He lifted his gun, took aim, and shot Gilbert in the back of the head. Oh. But before Archibald could run away, or ride away, Gilbert's mother grabbed his horse's reins and pulled him down close to her, like, into her face, completely enraged at the death of her son. Uh-huh. And she cursed Archibald, saying, When the hour of death approaches, no priest will be able to quench the ceaseless flames which burn in your bosom, and no words of affection soothe your dying pillow. Oh. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Now, those who saw him after this said that Archibald was very shaken by what the woman had said. He was scared of the curse and what it might mean for him when he was at his most vulnerable. And over the next few years, the servants told stories of what Archibald was like privately. He was very anguished. And on nights when it was particularly stormy or windy, because remember, he's on the coast. Yeah. Yeah. In an Uh, unfinished castle. (laughs) Yeah, he was tormented by the howling gale. The noise of it used to scare him and drive him around the bend, and he used to cry out things like, What woman was this who dared to scream so within the walls of Killeen Castle? Oh. So he was hearing her screaming at him on the wind. Wow, he just just went mad. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually, he became very, very ill. And there was very little that any of the doctors could do for him. He attacked them as they tried to help him to relieve his pain. And he ended up just sending them all away because nothing they did helped. Priests came, seeing that he was on his deathbed, and tried to soothe him, tried to comfort him, prepare him for his soul moving on. Now, there was nothing they could do to help him. He claimed that his chest was burning. And he got no relief. So he ended up sending the priest away. At the moment of his death, with everyone around him, Archibald's eyes bulged in fear. And he began to point at the bottom of his bed because he was seeing something that nobody else could see. And then he started laughing. Oh no. This is horrendous. He laughed as he died. And after he died, everyone who was there began hearing this unearthly cackling echoing around the room. And it was so awful and so terrifying that they all just started praying because they knew something wasn't right. Oh, God. Really creepy. Oh, it is really creepy. The day of the funeral came. And it was a big important affair because Archibald was Lord Kennedy. Oh. Befitting his status, his funeral carriage was to be pulled by four white horses. However, as soon as they were hitched to the carriage, one of the horses dropped dead. (laughs) And then the others kicked up in fear and couldn't be calmed down. That's fair. So they were replaced by four black horses. Oh. But initially, they all refused to move. They were, they were trained. It wasn't, oh. They weren't new horses. But they refused to pull the carriage anywhere. Now, they were getting desperate because they needed to carry out the funeral. The priest ordered the coffin to be taken off the carriage, which they did. And he said some words of prayer over Archibald's body. Mm-hmm. The coffin was picked up again. It was loaded up again. And this time, the horses moved. Weird. But at the moment the procession started moving... A storm picked up. Huh? It began to rain really heavily. And the funeral was almost called off completely. But as soon as they got to the burial site, the rain stopped. Mm. Now, when they reached Archibald's final resting place, they had a brief respite, but it began to rain and it began to hail and the wind picked up around them. But this time... Flashes of fire danced up and down the length of his coffin. (laughs) And the people watching didn't know what to make of it. They thought it was lightning. They thought it was the devil. Uh 
A lot of them were convinced this was the devil's work and the devil was coming to claim his soul because he had been such an evil person. I mean, that's a fair assumption to make yeah. in circumstances, I would say. Yeah. So the funeral was not going well. But as this was taking place, there was a ship in the bay near the castle and it was trying to make its way through the rough water that had been that was caused by the storm. Uh. They were trying to come back into, into shore. And the helmsman spotted a boat heading towards them. So it was coming away from the shore. Oh. Which confused them because nobody should have been heading out in no. that weather. They were trying to come in. But it got closer and closer until the whole crew realised that this wasn't a boat. It was a carriage. Oh. On the water. A carriage pulled by four black horses. Oh. Now, the captain called to the driver of the carriage, from whence to where? (laughs) And apparently the driver replied, from hell to Colleen's burial. (laughs) And that is the story of Colleen Castle. Oofed. That was a superb final story. (laughs) Did you like it? I did like that. I thought it was... Just brilliant. I loved every part of it. Yeah. I was going for creepy. It came off. Okay, good. (laughs) There's a thing, I think it's called like... Something Fire. St. Someone's Fire. St. Augustine's Fire. Which can happen on airplanes where like light or like electricity, like lightning bolts like dance around like the wiper blades in the windscreen and stuff. Oh, right. And it can happen on the tops of sails as well. And you see, like, um, like the big globes with all the static that you touch, and you see all like little oh, yeah. lightning bars. What that's called? Can't remember anything apparently. So I wonder if that that I mean, it could just be a lie, but maybe that was happening. The static was generating along the metal trim of the the coffin. And maybe to create all these lightning. If there was a big storm, yeah. It was when I was reading this alone by myself. The bit that creeped me out was him seeing something at the end of his bed as he was dying. Because I've heard of that happening to people. Have you? Where they're kind of out of it, they're not Uh quite with it, and they see people that aren't there. And they like talk to people that aren't there. Uh I've heard lots of people talk about that before, so that really creeped me out. That is really creepy. And then the laughing. The laughings. As As you die. The creepiest to me. Like that would that would freak me out. Mm-hmm. Very creepy. Because the, at the bottom of the bed, it's, it's kind of like sleep paralysis that can happen. Or I really bad flu, and I thought I, I could see myself standing at the bottom of the bed. That's oh, pretty yeah. weird. <laughs> it was awful to hear about. Yeah. I, hate, I mean, it kind of been nice for you, but yeah, I, I hated all of that story. I walked around the bed to turn off the light, got back into bed, and then I was like half awake, half dreaming that I could see myself doing that but from within the bed I was really unwell <laughs> yeah I think that was the most unwell you've ever been I think so yeah flu a couple of years ago pre-covid pre-covid just good old fashioned flu <laughs> that was weird but yeah that, that was anyway. what creeped me out the most because I've heard of that happening to people in yeah. more modern times but been... sometimes it's nice because they see people that they've lost oh that's nice so they're talking to them uh-huh. But it's just very unsettling. It is very unsettling. Very creepy. But that's Colleen Castle. That's Colleen Castle. Did you enjoy hearing about it? I did enjoy hearing about that. I want to go and visit. It's a very interesting place. Big time. Very interesting. Yeah. Very old. Very old. And very murdery. And quite murdery, it has <laughs> to be said. The guy sounds like an asshole. Which one? It. Well, that's true. <laughs> Which eh? one? All power-hungry decks. <laughs> so was it was it the slave owner? Was it the the poison poisoner? Was there a poisoner? Am I making that up? No, that was the that was the Erskins. The murderer. There was the er, no, yeah, the murderer. Which one? Yeah. Oh no, one of them got poisoned. Mm. One of them came back from France and got he poisoned. Got poison. Yeah, it wasn't a poisoner. Presumably, there was a poisoner nearby. Mm. Probably related. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this, if you're still listening. I know I did. I do wonder if anyone makes it to the very end of the episode. 
we did hear someone fell asleep during the Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> Shout out if you're listening to this. It's not as long. It's okay. We don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're not upset. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the story. I really, really enjoyed putting this together. I did. Too. Super interesting. And if you can rate and review us on on, on your podcast player, yes, it helps so much. It seems like such a little thing, but a rating and a review is what helps other people find the podcast. Uh-huh. So it's it's a, such an easy way to support us. It just takes a couple yeah. minutes. Just take out your phone, open it up, and just hit five stars. Think <laughs> or Boom. whatever you feel. No, just hit five stars. <laughs> I'm telling you how to feel. It's a fear hiccup. (laughs) Stress burps. And we will be back next week. Yes, we will. For spooky season. Spooky season. And boy, do I have spooky in mind. Oh, that's exciting. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. (laughs) Bye. We'll speak to you next time. Bye.